Welcome to the first video in the charts and data series. This is an introduction to the graphs you're going to be seeing. And in this video, we're going to look at five different graphs. The first graph we're going to look at is a histogram. It's the good old bar graph. Now on a bar graph, all that you're going to need to do is understand what the data is telling you and just read the graph. This graph here measures the number of siblings that each student has. So on the bottom, the x-axis, we have the number of siblings. Up on the top, how many students has that number of siblings? So I might ask you, how many students have six siblings? Firstly, we look at six on the graph. Once we've identified this bar, we have to read on the y-axis how many students there were. And there's 22. You just have to read this graph. That's the first graph. Our second graph is a scatter graph. This is again measuring two different things, in this case the number of cousins people have, compared to the number of uncles that they have. Now in a scatter graph you're looking for a trend. First of all, it seems here that as we increase the number of uncles, you seem to increase the number of cousins as well. And this is shown by this line here. This line is called a line of best fit. This line of best fit really shows us the trend of how things are increasing or decreasing. Now remember, it's the trend which is really important to you. If you're looking to get more than achieved, however, you're going to need to discuss some other features of one of these graphs. Now, other features include things like outliers, which are points which lie far away from that trend. Up the top here, somebody has only three uncles, but they have about 35 different cousins. Or, down the bottom here, somebody has 10 cousins, but 7 uncles, which is quite low compared to the number of uncles. You will need to identify these and comment on possible reasons why they might be outliers. And one last thing you could comment on is groups. You'll notice that there's a lot of people with around four to five uncles and generally have around 20 cousins. This is really, really common. And you might say, well, most people have about three brothers and sisters, such as your parents. This would equate to around 20 cousins and around four or five uncles. So these are four different things you can comment on or draw on a scatter graph. First, there's a line of best fit, and that line of best fit represents the trend of the graph, that as your number of uncles increases, so does your number of cousins. The next, we can also comment on outliers of the graph, points which don't fit our trend line. And finally, we can look for groups. There'll be clusters of people all bunched together, and you can think of reasons why those people are all clustered together. So that's a scatter graph. Our third graph is a time series graph. Again, we're going to be comparing something such as temperature to time now. Now you'll notice that there's going to be fluctuations. This measures the temperatures in Rome from January in 2007 to November in 2009. So it's over a three year period. Now this top line shows us the maximum temperatures and the bottom line shows us the minimum temperature each month. Now you'll notice sometimes the temperatures are hotter and sometimes they're lower. You're going to have to identify possible reasons why this could be happening. And this is the trend for a time series graph. Actually, you can see that it's summer in July in Rome. Therefore, you're going to have hotter temperatures. And it's winter around that November-January region. That's why it's colder in that month of the year. So you're going to look for seasonal trends in these time series graphs, not general upwards or downwards trends. The fourth type of graph you're going to be looking at is a dot plot. Now a dot plot is just a visual representation comparing two or more things. Here we're comparing 9 year olds to 13 year olds. And they're actually guessing the number of dots on one of these graphs. Now you'll notice that all the 9 year olds and all the 13 year olds all seem to guess around this 40 to 60 region. But you'll also notice that you did get a couple of 9 year olds which seem to guess particularly high values, much higher than the normal. And you can call these outliers as well. But just before we move on to the fifth type of graph, I want to go into the three types of average because you'll see, on average, people guess around about 50. Now the first type of average you can have is your mean, and this is your most common type of average. This is when you add up all the guesses together and you divide by how many numbers there are. So in this case, I might add the guesses of sort of 25, 50, etc, etc, and then divide by the total 30 guesses. This is going to give me an average number. And in this case, my average guess for 9-year-olds was 57.8, whereas the mean for 13-year-olds was 51.8. Now, if we're including all the numbers for 9-year-olds, this mean is going to be influenced by this big guess here of 160 and these two big guesses of over 100. So this mean is affected by these outliers here, which makes it the second best measure of average. The best way to measure average is the median. 
the median is just the middle number in each set. So there's a middle number at the top here in age 9, which is 45, and the middle number in age 13 is 45 as well. This middle number is often a much better way to see an average, because it doesn't get affected by these outliers up the top. The last way that you can measure average in a graph like this, or any graph, is called the mode. The mode is the number that is guessed most often. You'll notice that we have two modes for 9 year olds, where we had the same number of people guessing 45 as we did 43. And down the bottom for 13 year olds, you'll see that we have three people guessing 43. That's our most common guess. That's our mode for 13 year olds and our mode for 9 year olds. But just remember, your median is the best measure of average. So if somebody gives you a situation and says the mode is the best, you have to correct them in your exam because you do get questions on that. And our last type of graph. This is a box and whisker graph. This is where you have two boxes and each box has whiskers out the top and the bottom. You're going to have to learn what the top and the bottom of each whisker is, the top and the bottom of each box, and what the middle line of the box is. This box and whisker is actually just a more accurate representation of the dot plot we saw in the previous slide. The first thing you have to know is that this middle line in the box is the median. And remember the median is your best measure of average. So just before we explain what the median is, look at the graph. This is comparing students at an air show over 10 years. And we're comparing day one of the air show to day two of the air show. Now it might look like more people came on day two, but actually if we look at the median, the middle line, you'll see that the median for day two is lower than the median for day one. So on average, less people came in day two because it has a lower median. The other points we need to know, we need to know that the top of the box is called the upper quartile. This upper quartile means a quarter of our days were above this point here. And again, we have the lower quartile down the bottom. This means a quarter of the time, the student population was below this level. That must mean that our middle half lies in this box here. So we've got the median that's in the middle, we've got the upper and the lower quartile, which give us a boundary. And the benefits of that is, is when we go up and look at the maximum and minimum, often those points can just be extremes. We don't really want to know about extreme examples and charts and data. We want to know about averages so that we can say the likelihood is we're going to have something similar to the median or something at least in this range here, which is near the center. So remember, median is your best measure of average. And the last helpful thing you can take out of these graphs is a measure of spread. Now spread just means how spread out your data is. You can see on day two that the number of students attending is far more variable. Sometimes it can be below 200 and sometimes it can be above 500, nearly at 600. Whereas day one, it's far more consistent. Generally goes between sort of 250 and 450. And the way we measure the spread of our data is by using what's called an interquartile range. This is the difference between the upper quartile and the lower quartile. And it just shows you how spread out this box is in the middle. So that means that day two will have a much bigger spread, a much bigger interquartile range than day one will, because day one is more consistent. So let's look at what you need to know. First graph we looked at was a bar graph, a histogram. On this bar graph, you just need to look at the graph and read values off it. Not too hard. The second graph we looked at was a scatter graph. On a scatter graph, you need to understand what the trend is doing. Generally, the dots will form some kind of line. You have to draw a line of best fit, which shows you the trend. And you can look for outliers, points which don't fit that line. You can also look for groups and clusters of data. The third graph we looked at was time series graph. This is similar to a scatter graph, but it always compares something against time. Now we looked at temperature, but lots of things change over time, and your job is to look for a trend that changes with time. So it'll fluctuate up and down, up and down, up and down. You've got to match that to a time or a season. The fourth graph we looked at was a dot plot. Now a dot plot's a really good way for you to visually look at how data is spread out. If you have an outlier, you'll be able to see that because the dot's far, far away from the other dots. Or you'll be able to see where the middle is, roughly just because of the shape of the graph. It also shows you spread. If your dots are all spread out, you must have a lot of spread in your data. And remember, your median is the most accurate measure of center. It's your most accurate average. Finally, we looked at a box and whisker plot. Now, a box and whisker plot, again, you have to compare the medians of the box and whisker plots. The median is this middle line. And if you want to go further and you're looking to get merit and excellence, you'll need to discuss the spread of this data. How spread out is each box? Because the more spread out it is, the more variation there is in your data. For example, this number three here has a higher spread than number two. And just to reinforce, median is again your best measure of average. Always compare the medians, not any other points on this graph.
Let's look at a question now. Tua, whose grandfather, told him that a person's arm span is often the same as their height. So your arm span is actually the distance from your fingertips of your left hand to the fingertips of your right hand when your arms are stretched out. Now Tua, who wondered if this was actually true, so he collected measurements from 100 randomly selected year 10 boys and girls. He drew a scatter graph of the results. We've actually got some statistics too down here. And he's already put a line of best fit on this graph. We need to find out what is the height of the tallest person on the graph What's the height with the person with the smallest arm span? And how many people have an arm span between 120 and 135 centimeters? Now you'll notice that all of these questions, we just have to read the graph. It's in the next video, which we're going to learn how to explain these in slightly more detail, because there is a bit more theory behind this. But first, let's look. What is the height of the tallest person on the graph? To look at this, we have to find the height on the bottom axis. So the height of a person is measured here. So we need to find our point, which is the furthest right. And this is the point in the top right hand corner. You'll notice it's just above 200 centimeters. So our answer is that the tallest person is about 201 centimeters. Next, let's look, what is the height of the person with the smallest arm span? Arm spans measured on these vertical axes here. So looking for the lowest vertical point, we'll find the smallest arm span. And that's this point down the very bottom center. Now, we don't want to find the arm span. It says what's the height of that person. We need to look for the height of the person with the 60 centimeter arm span. And that's 160 centimeters. So the height of the person with the smallest arm span is 160 centimeters. How many people have an arm span between 120 and 135 centimeters? So let's look. Here's the line for 120 centimeters. Let's count the people above it until we hit 135, which is halfway between these two lines. We start at 120, we have one person, we have two people, and then suddenly we're up near 140. So we actually only have two people here between 120 centimeters and 135 centimeter arm spans. So our answer would just be the number of people with an arm span between 100 and 135 centimeters is two.